Our ladies who are on a retreat. So we have a number of our ladies who are in the rain somewhere. So I thought we might want to take a moment and just pray for those ladies and that they'll have a wonderful day in safety as they return. And I was just talking very briefly with Jeff this morning, and, uh, and I was just asking him well, how school was going. You know, he's a teacher in school, and it's very disturbing to hear that it's been really, really poor on many, many fronts. So you said the classrooms haven't been too bad, uh, but there's been scads of fights and controversies and all kinds of problems that are, that are going on there. It seems like the young people who have been secluded from each other have now got together and don't know how to associate with one another. So there seems to be a lot of conflict. Uh, that's very troubling to hear, don't you think? And so I thought, well, maybe we ought to just pray for our schools. Just pray for our schools. Okay, let's bow our heads, lift up our hearts. My Father, thank you so very much that you've uh, given us this time together. We thank you for a very comfortable, warm, dry place to be. And Lord, uh, we are so grateful for your wonderful uh, kindness that you ex extend to us daily, uh, hourly, and uh, certainly you allow us to come together as your people, and it is a great, great blessing. Lord, there is a concern, as we uh, have mentioned already, uh, for our schools and our school systems. And Lord, there's so many things that are very difficult to deal with. And Lord, certainly violence is one of them. And Lord, I don't really know the answers uh, of what they can actually do, but I do know a change of heart only comes from Christ himself. So we do know that ultimately the answer is gonna be salvation for these young people. And Lord, it's so sad. We seem to have lost so many people in this generation and other generations as well. Lord, we just pray that the Spirit of God might move in a mighty way and that there's, if there's something that we could do to help, that you'll guide us and direct us in that way. And Lord, we do want to pray for our ladies. We thank you so very much for them. Uh, we pray that it'll be a wonderful Lord's Day for them as they worship together in a different place. And Lord, that you'll bring them back safely to us. And we thank you for them. And we also now want to pray as we look into your word that the, the Spirit of God will open up minds and hearts to these wonderful truths found in the book of Romans. Through Jesus we give you thanks and we pray. Amen. A defense attorney was cross-examining a police officer during a felony trial. And it went like this. Question. Officer, did you see my client flee the scene? Answer, no, sir. But I subsequently observed a person matching the description of the offender running several blocks. Question, officer, who provided you this description? Answer, the officer who responded to the scene of the crime. Question, a fellow officer provided you the description of this so-called offender? Do you trust this fellow officer? Answer, yes, sir, with my life. Question, with your life? Let me ask you this then. Do you have a locker room in the police station, a room where you change your clothes in preparation for your daily duties? Answer, yes, sir, we do. Question, and do you have a locker in that room? Yes, sir, I do. And do you have a locker on your lock? Uh, do you have a lock on your locker? Why, yes, sir, said the policeman. The question is now, why is it, officer, if you trust your fellow officer with your life, that you find it necessary to actually lock your locker? in a room where you share these same, with these same officers? The answer was this. You see, sir, we share the building with a court complex, and sometimes lawyers have been known to walk through that room. <laughs> There'll be no further questions, Your Honor. It is often assumed that those connected with the law and even the law itself would only bring that which was right and just and good about, 
but that really would be a wrong assumption. Quite often, we, uh, what we thought would actually be good turns out to be just the opposite. For instance, Scripture many, many times over describes God's righteous standards, the law, as being spiritual. Spiritual. You would think then, in using the law, only that which is good would actually come from it. You would think that the law of God could be used to make you and I holy. But the assumptions would be absolutely wrong. What we have failed to consider is that you and I, even when saved, have an unredeemed body. An unredeemed body. By that I mean, even though I am no longer a slave of sin in my inner man, my father is no longer the devil. I am no longer in love with the world. I am still in the flesh. Although I am no longer enslaved to its sinfulness as I once was, save from sin's total mastery and its condemnation, in myself, that is, in my fleshly humanness, and even as a Christian, you and I are no more holy or sinless than we were before salvation. Sin, then, will ever be before me and you with disturbing frequency, still deceiving and still attracting me to many of its allurements. So let's read Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, of, this, of the great tension, tremendous tension, that resides with every true born-again believer between sin and righteousness. So shall we stand in honor of God's word, if you're able? And we're going to read Romans chapter 7. We're going to begin at verse 14, and we're going to go through the end of the chapter. Verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am cardinal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not uh, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Please be seated if you will. Every biblically taught and honest Christian can actually relate well to what we have just heard Paul describe. Now, this is not an unsaved Paul. This is not a newly saved Saul or Paul struggling in his newfound life in Christ. No, this is the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul. And only a true Christian, growing in the Christian lives with such a tension of sin against righteousness in their lives, understands. Why? Because only a Christian has the divine nature, the divine nature 
of God within him that causes such a struggle. Because he is no longer in Adam, but now in Christ, the believer possesses a spirit-given desire to be conformed to Christ's own image and be made perfected in righteousness. But sin still clutches to our humanness. It is still has the power to enslave him, to be sold under sin, verse 14, even though it can no longer be our master. A believer who has subsequently followed Christ has and will continue to have the experience that Paul is describing in his life as a Christian in verses 14 through 25 at one time or another in his life. Now, before we come under the teaching of the gospel, some of us were blissfully unaware, unaware of the, I would say, the depth of our actual sin. But as we learn God's word, his law, we began to discover God's righteous requirements and our sinfulness became painfully apparent. Now, now that we have become Christians, and, be, and because we are his children, life becomes a continuing revelation of the radical nature of ourselves, our sin. Every year, as we grow in the Lord, we should become more and more aware that though I have been born again, and my sins are totally forgiven, past, present, future, by the blood of Christ that we are going to be celebrating in a little bit at our communion table, I am in myself, in my humanity, thoroughly, disgustingly sinful. The more I understand God's law, his word, his righteous standards, the more I see my sins as utterly sinful. The law has no power to save a sin-sick soul, nor does it have the power to actually sanctify the saved, to bring them to Christ's likeness. But it does have the power to let you know what sin is and to say, that is not acceptable. It does provide you with a gauge to righteousness that you might sin, that you might not sin against God. And it provides a spiritual believer a sensitivity to sin. As long as a believer remains on earth in his mortal and corrupted body, God's law will continue to be our spiritual ally. The obedient, spirit-filled believer will greatly value and honor all the moral and spiritual commandments of God. Therefore, although the law cannot save or sanctify, it is still... Holy, righteous, and good, according to Romans 7, 12. And obedience to it provides great benefits to both the saved and the unsaved. But the law does not bring change of heart. Instead, the law does not bring change. When I see the fullness and grandeur of God's law, it will be realized in, in a measure that we cannot experience until we are with the Lord. Paul, while desiring in his spiritual life in Christ to be fulfilled spiritually as well as, I would say, in the letter of the law, he realized that he was unable to live up to the Lord's perfect standard and his own heart's desire. The lines of tension are then tremendously drawn here. 
And that's what we want to take a look at. Tremendous tension that is being displayed before us this morning. So let's take a look at some of this tension. We have Romans seven fifteen. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. How many have been in that particular condition before? Yeah, that's me. And, and Paul finds himself doing things he did not approve of. He confesses he is not practicing what he would like to do. It is impossible to deny. This is the experience of every true Christian. Every true Christian. He is no longer self-righteous as Paul once was, who thought himself blameless before God's law. A true Christian knows that he doesn't live up to it, yet he wants to. He actually wants to. It's a struggle all true believers have, wanting to do what is right while being unable in ourselves to actually do it. The problem is not with God's law. It is, the problem is not with God's word. It is not the problem with righteousness, which is what true believers desires, but with the distracting energies of indwelling sin, which is the point of verses 16 and 17 of our text. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. It is reported that near Tarsus, where Paul was actually born, a tribe of people lived who inflicted a most terrible penalty on a murderer. They fastened the body of the victim to the killer, tying shoulder to shoulder, back to back, thigh to thigh, arm to arm, ankle to ankle, and they drove the murderer from the community. Get out. With who he killed on his back. So tight were the bonds that he could not free himself, and after a few days, the death in the body tied to him communicated itself to the living flesh of the murderer. And as he walked the, the, throughout the land, there was none, no one, who would help him. He had only the frightful prospect of a gangrenous death, and he would, he would cry in horror, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That's what you and I have. It's not strapped to us, it's part of us. So we look at verses 18 and 19. And I want to really say, that would be quite a deterrent to murder, don't you think? And it was. Verses 18 and 19. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. The flesh in itself is not sinful, but it is still subject to sin and its corruptive nature. The flesh furnishes sin a beachhead from which to operate in the believer's life. Paul is not saying that he is totally incapable of doing anything that was good and right. He is saying because of sin in him, he was incapable of completely fulfilling the requirements of God's holy law. Even though saved, even though sealed, a believer has a flesh that if sin sets in, has the power to actually contaminate everything. 
The spiritual believer knows that because of sin, he can grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30. You can grieve the Spirit with your sin. How many believers have probably done that? Every single one of us. I have grieved the Spirit of God. I have dishonored God. 1 Corinthians 6.20. Sin can keep our prayers from being answered. 1 Peter 3.12. Sin can make our lives spiritually powerless. 1 Corinthians 9.27. Powerless. The spiritual believer is sensitive to sin because it causes good things from God to actually be withheld. Jeremiah 5, 25. Because it robs him of the joy of his salvation. Psalm 51, 12. Just check out David. Just check out David. Because it inhibits spiritual growth. 1 Corinthians 3, 1. Because it brings chastisement from the Lord himself. Hebrews 12, 5, and 7. Whom he loves, he does what? Disciplines. Because it prevents his being a fit vessel for the Lord to use. 2 Timothy 2, 21. The spiritual believer is sensitive to sin because it pollutes Christian fellowship. 1 Corinthians 10, 21. Because it prevents participating properly in the Lord's table. 1 Corinthians 11, 28 and 29. And because it can even endanger his physical life and health. 1 Corinthians and 1 John 5. So here we have, you can grieve the spirit. You can dishonor God. Prayer not answered. Powerless. God, good withheld, robs joy, inhibits growth, chastisement, makes you an unfit vessel, pollutes fellowship, affects the Lord's table, endangers health and life. First Corinthians, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. That's from the what? The Lord's table. The Lord's table. First John 5, 16, if anyone seeks his brother sinning a sin, if anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, which does not lead to death, he will ask. And he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. Why is the spiritual believer sensitive to sin? Why? Because he knows nothing good dwells in him. Because he knows with sin the good that he wishes to do, he does not do. And that is why we are told to abstain from even the appearance of evil in Scripture. Suppose sewerage is carried away in a wooden flume which passes through a clear flowing spring. If the flume should lose a board, the sewerage would pour into the spring, thoroughly contaminating it, and the water becoming polluted and unsafe to drink. What must take place to avoid this contamination is that the flume must be taken out of the spring or be contained, it contained in such a way that its contents cannot spurt through the wood. The flume is our flesh. The sewerage is our sin. And one day the flesh will be changed so that it no longer can contaminate the clear flowing spring of our new nature. Until then, the flume and its sewerage of sin uh, are within every one of us, and even though no boards can come off 
to foul the spring totally because our relationship to Christ, there is always this seepage, this seepage that keeps the water from having the unmixed perfection of Jesus Christ, which we shall possess fully in heaven. Now, to control the seepage, we are told to walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Because we have so much seepage, we need the Spirit of God. Grace has been provided to prevent the outbreak of sin. Grace is given to maintain us in our march through the Christian life despite indwelling sin. Yet, the struggle with sin does not go away. And that was so important for me when I, was, when I was developing in my Christian life and trying to learn what was going on. I thought, hey, I'm saved now. Why am I still having this struggle? Why am I still having all these things going on in my head, in my life, in my actions? Why? Our text explains why. The continuing evil in the believer's life is so universal that Paul refers to it as a law. As a law. So we look at verses 20 and 21 here. You cannot, uh, um, let me see. I lost my spot here. Hold on just a second. Here it is. Now, if you do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. So any science, any counseling, any psychology, any psychiatry, which ignores the law of sin, must ultimately wander hopelessly astray from the truth and any genuine help for people. Yet, our schools, our universities, and many supposing counseling that goes on today teach every law imaginable but the law of sin. The fact remains, however, that it is the law of sin that really explains why people behave and do what they do. It is the root of all behavioral problems. So I guess if we really think about it, Jeff, as, as far as what the problem is at your school, sin. Sin is the problem in his school. Sin is the problem in all schools. It is the root of all behavioral problems. Paul finds that while the law of Sinai, God's revealed righteous standards, point him to heaven, the law of sin causes even in the believer the practice of evil that we do not wish to do. There are then two principles at work in every believer. Two principles. So we read of them in our text. Romans 22 and 23. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. One principle. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. The second principle. So in verse 22, the apostle justified inner man is on the side of the law of God and no longer on the side of sin. Every true believer knows what Paul is talking about here. In the recesses of the redeemed person's mind is this hunger and thirst for God's righteousness 
Like David of the Old Testament, we are people after God's own heart. We read of the Sermon on the Mountain and we say, yes, I want to be like that. We study the life of Jesus Christ and we say, yes, I want to follow my Lord just like that. And we read in Philippians this. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, I press on, that I may hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press forward that goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. And how about 2 Corinthians 4, 16? Therefore, we do not lose heart, Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Or how about Ephesians 3.16? He that would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Our inner born-again life says with the psalmist, the law is my delight. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. There is this part of every true believer that longs to be made into the likeness of Jesus Christ. I long it for myself. And I would long it for you as well. What do you think he longs for? So no longer is our master. He indeed has redeemed, we are redeemed by God to be conformed to the Savior. But there is also this corresponding but opposite principle which does not operate in the inner person but in the members of the believer's body. The outer man. That is, in his unredeemed and still sinful humanness, which continually wages war against the law of the believer's mind. Now, let me just make a little bit of a clarification here. This is kind of important. Paul is not teaching. Now get this. He is not teaching that believers live a divided life, a dichotomy between the mind and the body. He is not teaching that. Sinning with the flesh, but serving God with the mind. No, no, no. That is not what he is teaching here. Paul is merely contrasting the inner man or the redeemed new creature in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, with the flesh, Romans 7, 25, or that remnant of the old man that will remain with each believer until we receive our glorified bodies, Romans 8, 23, and we'll study when we get into Romans 8. The the believer's mind is not always spiritual, nor is our body always sinful. The point is, Paul experienced was that there is a struggle a struggle within him between the flesh and the spirit. And we read Galatians 5. Galatians 5. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under law. Not under law. The law of sin tries to assert itself in the members of the believer's body so that often, involuntarily, the eyes look with lust. The tongue wags in gossip. 
while the ears strain to hear that which is improper and impure. As long as the believer remains in his mortal body, in his old, unredeemed humanness, he remains subject to temptation and sin. And I want you to think of it like this. A teacher advancing in years became afflicted with Parkinson's disease. Everybody familiar with Parkinson's? It would cause, it caused trembling in her hands. And when she worked at the blackboard, her hands trembled so much that the chalk leaved or left wavy lines. In her mind, the writing is meant to be clear and legible, but on the blackboard, it was deformed by the shakiness of her hand. The mind determines straight figures, but the hand is totally unable to execute what the mind desires. That which the, that which the palsy hand does, the renewed mind does not want to do. The hand does what the mind hates. So then, it is not the mind that is doing it, but palsy that dwells in the brain. The mind can will perfection, but the hand cannot do it. For the hand does not the good which the mind desires, and how to perform what the mind wishes to do, the hand finds not. Now, if the hand does that which the mind would not, it is no more the mind that is doing it, but the palsy that dwells in the brain. The mind delights in straight figures, but another law is working in the members, warring against the law of the mind, and bringing every action into captivity to the palsy. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the, from the palsy? Thank God! Full deliverance will come with the return of the Lord when we shall see him and be like him. Then we shall know perfectly unmixed good. So then, with our mind, we yield to the Lord and draw straight figures, even though the palsy of our old Adam in the flesh makes them shaky on the board of action. You see, Paul discovered that sin, the palsy, was still present with him, even though it had no mastery over his mind. That in himself, the straight strokes of his mind, no matter how watchful, prayerful, or faithful, were flawed due to the indwelling sin in him. Paul learned we need a power greater than ourselves. Did you get that? We need a power greater than ourselves. And this is exactly what has been taught and done by identifying us with Christ in his death and resurrection in Romans chapter 6 and the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8, and between 6 and 8 is 7 and the tension. The tension. The mature Christian knows that he will always be in Romans 7 apart from the knowledge, the knowledge of Romans chapter 6, who you are in Christ, and the Holy Spirit from Romans chapter 8 who is the medicine for the palsy. He's the medicine for the palsy. That power that, that the new mind in Christ needs to function with straight lines in the body, we have been given the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and the body of Christ, His church, to help us and to empower us to live this new life in Christ. 
The true Christian can say that a new man has already been born in him, but he can also must confess that the sinful part of this old man has not yet ceased to be. And although a Christian cannot avoid living in the unredeemed body, he can and should avoid walking according to the flesh in its sinful ways. Thus, Romans 7 reveals the tension and the struggle of the Christian life and the victory over sin, which will not be achieved in ourselves, but provides and prepares us for the power of the Spirit of God in Romans 8 that works in us that we might live a straight line. So, that in the final analysis, the triumph is God's and God's alone. That He gets the glory. And that's why you're here. So that He gets glory. Right? That's your purpose in life. That He gets glory. We do not and must not rely on the, on the strength to live the Christian life. You will not make it. You'll always be in Romans 7. You'll always be in Romans 7. We cannot live the Christian. We can't save ourselves. We need the Spirit of God to work in us there. And to live the Christian life, we are going to need the Holy Spirit to actually provide us a power we in and of ourselves do not have. So Romans 7 prepares us for what? Not the chronology of Romans 8, but the power of the Spirit of God in our lives. Isn't that great? Amen. Romans 6, who you are in Christ. Romans 7, the tension. Romans 8, the victory is yours in the power of God. Let's pray. Well, my Father, thank you so very much for the wonderful Word of God. It teaches us all we need to know, and I do want to pray you might help us to get out of seven and into eight. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat>